Greetings, folks. I uh, would like to welcome you to the third in a series of webinars put on by the Light Brigade. And I'd like to thank Stephen Hardy and the uh, Lightwave Online team for hosting these programs. I have a couple of uh, housekeeping issues to deal with. Our presenter today is going to be Larry Johnson, who is the director and founder of the Light Brigade. One question about, uh, I mean, the ability to answer questions, ask questions. In the lower left-hand box, you'll find on your display the ability to ask questions. There's two types of questions you might ask. One is about technical issues. We'll answer those right away with our technical team. The other questions might be pertaining to something you have about the webinar itself. And we will hold off to the end of those, uh, at the end of the webinar, and then ask, answer all those questions at the same time. We also are running a blog on LightWave online under the educational page. And you can post additional questions there that we could respond to. And what we're also looking for is some ideas of what you might like to see in future webinars uh, throughout the rest of the year. Uh, at this time, I want to turn the program over to Larry Johnson, who will then present do the presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here. A uh, little background on the Light Brigade. Uh, our founding was in 1986. Since uh, that time, we've uh, trained over 45,000 uh, technicians and designers, engineers, etc. And you can read on the, the screen our strengths. Um, one of the items that I put down there was on the experience side because when you deal with emergency restorations, as many of you probably have been involved with, there seems to be no two alike. They're very unique, and your expertise comes from experience, and you're able to apply this. And at the same time, our, our customers and clients in, our, in the training world are very open to sharing with us their findings and, um, and uh, what uh, is needed to develop plans. And that's where the focus is um, um, for the future. Okay, so one of the uh, basics on restorations, is, should it occur, is to identify what type of outage it is, locate the outage, and resolve the outage. And depending on the amount of time that you spend and the amount of funding that you have to develop platforms, for in other words, um, management systems that can automatically detect and isolate a problem, um, life can be a little easier, but the resolution of a restoration can be uh, very intense. And uh, I always like this Murphy's Law type of statement, cable failure will happen at the worst possible time at the worst conceivable location. And then we broke that down into different areas. So system related would involve the transmission equipment, the uh, powering of the systems, um, thing, uh, items of failures that would be located around patch panels, for example, where technicians or workers can get their hands around the fiber or and if it's not properly installed or routed correctly, it's a weak point. So they tend that failures tend to occur around patch panels as well, anywhere people have access to fibers. And then um, the heavier causes of uh, outages, construction or work related, especially parallel construction, um, underground placement, aerial. Um, then human error, vandalism, and that human elements involved. Uh, vandalism are the worst cases, and it's one that uh, anyone worldwide needs to pay attention to to protect their uh, physical layer um, um, design. And then Mother Nature, those, that, uh, those items like storms, uh, washouts, earthquakes, uh, et cetera, that are tremendous and can be extremely disruptive, not necessarily we're talking about an hour outage or so, but these could take days or weeks. Because unless it's a safe environment, you cannot do a, a restoration. And that, so it has to, you have to deal with safety, and that means you have to work around the environment. And so therefore, planning and preparation of a restoration are key. And one last notice for those that are looking at a restoration plan, is take a look at your past history of outages. And it doesn't matter if you're running coax or twisted pair or microwave. What types of outages have you had? And what was the cause of those outages? Because those same occurrences will, will occur in the future. And what we try to do is learn from the past and apply them for the future. 
So here's a, uh, an idea of some cost numbers that can be lost in revenue on a fiber circuit, uh, and this is based on an hour of outage. And of course, numbers vary depending on the, the types of uh, services you're carrying for um, clients, and that Wall Street's different than uh, travel agents and banking and such. So, so there's a value, and this is where service level agreements are established to maintain uh, reliability, alternate uh, routing plans, uh, et cetera, to make sure that these revenues aren't lost because there is a, a tremendous finance associated with this. And in the United States, if, if a farmer, for example, digs up a cable with a plow, he's not liable for the lost revenue. All he's liable for is the cost of the restoration. Now, that statement can vary worldwide and all this, but at some point there's a policy statement in place to say who's responsible for what. But the, the best thing is to try to prevent outages by having good designs and good plans. So just as a review of typical types of fiber damage, uh, the photograph you see is just a shotgun pellet and a cable. Um, but the, so that could be a partial damage. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to take out all the fibers in a cable, and that's something we want to talk about later. But a complete cut, in other words, then we have a choice of, of a retrievable slack scenario or a non-retrievable slack scenario, and we'll address this later on. The other is a partial damage to the cable, and then we have to identify exactly what fibers are damaged and to what degree and how would we make the repair. And the other could be high fiber attenuation where a cable, say an auger, uh, has dug up a cable and has stressed the buffer tubes in the cable to, that's putting stress onto the fibers and they're therefore attenuating the, the fibers. And so do we replace that section or do we go to alternate fibers? So we have to find a solution. That solution is going to be based on what our findings are. And an open fiber is where fiber is just broken. This is very rare today, but in the early days of fiber optics in the uh, seven, late 70s or 80s, there was fibers just due to the coating technologies and the cable structures at the time that some, sometimes the fibers would break. Um, very rare in that. I've had it occur a couple times but uh, in my experiences, but uh, hard to find. You hate those type in that. The other occurrence on an open fiber is where if a fiber was improperly stripped, and that during the splicing process and a future um, scribe or crack into the glass could uh, propagate through the fiber later during an environmental change. Uh, the OGDR would pick this up as being a break at a splice location, but it's actually not the splice that was caused by the workmanship and the tooling. And that um, some other ones here is uh, aerial problems, uh, gunshot, such as the uh, shotgun pellet you saw before, uh, lightning strikes on structures. It uh, doesn't necessarily have to be on the cable. It could be on a pole, and that could, which could also cause failure. Uh, trees and branches, fires themselves. Many times uh, cables have uh, been fires under cables. The cable jacketing has gone, but the fiber is still operating. But there's no coating in it, so therefore it's extremely fragile, and, and the restoration has to be handled uh, very carefully. Um, vehicular, where a car goes off a road and actually hits a pole, brings down the structure and, bring, and damages the cable. And then there's cases in underground and ducted installations where the cable's dug up and needs repair. Rodents, of course, so will eat anything that their mouth can get around. Um, so how to protect against rodents. Um, icing problems, we want to make sure that uh, Closures, uh, splice closures in particular, are sealed and flash tested to make sure we do not get uh, water intrusion into the closure, which can compress on the fiber uh, when freezing and uh, create higher losses and potentially take your system into a minor or major alarm. Um, crushed or collapsed uh, ducts that uh, put stress onto a cable and improper installation as well. Uh, underground uh, occurrences, backfilling, uh, you know, when you put a cable in the, and then you just all of a sudden take a bulldozer or a backhoe and just push rocks and boulders and that back on top of a cable, you can add stress. So you've got to be careful on the type of materials used for backfilling. Uh, washouts tend to be more of a mother nature issue. However, they can put a, a enormous stress on a cable over an extremely long distance. Uh, again, when we talk about OTDRs, we'll talk about not only where the break is, but where the stress is. And again, we have rodents digging, plowing, 
and even the occasional bore. Most of the time, it's not the bore itself under, going under a road or river or something. It's the bore pits on either side of the installation that cause the, the problem. So good locates are, are invaluable here. And if you notice the picture on the auger, that the warning tape in this case got spooled up on the inside of the auger, so the operator never saw the warning tape. And this was um, six inch wide tape, and you can see it's, very, uh, it's not very visible. The other uh, fact with this one is most of the fibers actually survived the auger, and that even though there was extreme uh, macro bending. Um, moving on to splice closures, you can see a photograph here of where uh, one of the buffer tubes is kinked, uh, leaving the, uh, the splice tray. This is, could be two things. One is the material in the buffer tube itself that uh, is more whether it's more flexible or less and that causing it. The other one is the technician still should have seen it, still should have dressed it properly to make sure this doesn't occur. And that, but improper bending in this case and probably again the amount of, uh, the length of the buffer tube that was cut. And then again, um, you know, trying to watch out for tie wraps that can compress onto the buffer tubes or pigtails and that that can cause uh, micro bends as well. And then splice clo uh, crossovers where maybe the blue and orange fibers were switched over improperly spliced, which, uh, believe it or not, about 10% of men are colorblind. So um, some of the colors and bad lighting, can, uh, this can occur. So we want to make sure we get the right colors um, spliced to each other. And then in the case of where we're doing mid-entry drops, um, to make sure that color code charts are assigned and followed properly. Again, um, you know, what types of failure rates are, occur in fiber optic systems. And it says, number one, cable cuts account for 25% of the major outages. And those are the ones that we really try to prevent. Um, if we have power failures or transmitter failures, we have to deal with that from a network perspective. But outside plant cuts are, are major outages that require reaction time and that of those 25%, the largest cause is human error in that, which is 40% of the 25%. And the average outage takes over five hours to repair, but I also have been involved with outages that have taken days to repair and, uh, and then to go from some, sometimes from a temporary repair to a permanent repair can take weeks or months just depending on um, the responsible party access, um, liabilities, contracts, many reasons. So what we like to do is have everybody that's involved with uh, fiber optic systems in the outside plant, or in, and even those in the premises world, is to put together a restoration plan. And to do so, it's good to have a questionnaire that you can use to address your own applications. So. Um, what uh, we have here is because it's uh, three pages and a lot of uh, text is that you can email jim.cloudfelter at lightbrigade.com and he can email the questionnaire to you and that versus going over 37 line items or so that we would have to do here. However, the questionnaire, is, the purpose of the questionnaire is for you to define where you are today, what your posture is today, and what you need to do to design a, um, a plan that's best suited for your application. So in other words, you customize it. And because networks run different um, topologies, they run different environments, it could be aerial, it could be direct buried, it could be inducted, um, you could be in high density, low density, you may have to have several different plans uh, written. Um, so, and do always pay attention to whether or not you would have a retrievable or non-retrievable slack scenario. Because if it's a non-retrievable slack, that means not only you're going to have to repair the, the point of outage, but you're going to have to splice in a section, which means two locations, excess cable, um, hand holes, storage, uh, splice trays, possibly snowshoes, a lot of apparatus. And you're going to have to address um, items such as the equipment that's going to be needed. And that's not only OTDRs and, and splice closures and things like that, but also could be heavy heavy duty equipment such as backhoes or boom trucks. Um, for some reason, um, environmental problems keep popping up. And most of the restorations that I've been on actually did not occur in nice sunny days. They occurred in the worst weather. Um, and uh, so you have to address how you're going to react in bad weather scenarios and that. 
You also have to make sure that you have the right staff available and the right processes for who, who's working in what sequence and uh, what assignments. And then make sure that these people have the proper tools to do the job correctly. One of the things that uh, helps us on restorations is the, the, to have a good level of documentation. And this starts um, actually in the design phase because the designer needs to identify what the expectations are on documentation, test reports, and as-built drawings. And it, uh, during the acceptance testing of a, a new fiber span, then we get OTDR traces, optical loss testing occurring at the, the applicable wavelengths for the system, single mode normally 1310 and 1550 nanometers, and multi-mode 850 and 1300 nanometers. Um, good maintenance records to show if there were ch uh, changes made to the network, uh, repairs made, et cetera. Um, these need to be updated, and documentation is only as good as the time that's put into it, and, and also as much as it's been updated and documented. And then um, also keeping an idea what documentation would be required for restoration, so TDR charts and uh, power levels, in particular of transmitter and receiver power levels, are, are great for this. So in the documentation issues, uh, the goal is to develop a restoration plan and use the documentation and make sure it's accessible for those that are going to perform a restoration. Um, make sure you have a final as-built um, document and that, um, that uh, it's current. Excuse me here. Okay, and a uh, little glitch here on my end. Um, and that you have a good cable data manual. Um, in other words, what cables go where, what fibers are, are allocated to whom. If they're um, involved with DWDM, not only do you have to go with fiber management now, but now you're going to have to deal with wavelength management as well. You also need to have a routing plan for the cable in this. And I want to address this um, point of prioritized circuits. If you have an emergency restoration and you have 144 fiber cable and they're all carrying traffic, there's certain fibers that may take a priority over others. And unless those are identified early on, um, the splicer that's assigned to do the restoration, they will normally just to follow the color code um, um, of the, the fiber and cable color code standards by the TIA 598 standard and just follow them in sequence. And what may happen is you may be splicing uh, low priority circuits where you have some very high priority circuits that need to be completed first. And so it's extremely critical that you identify those ahead of time. And again, your attenuation report should be there. And um, for the use of an emergency restoration kit, which we'll also go over later, we want to make sure that the bill of materials is included because if you need to uh, replenish those kits uh, periodically, especially if there's date-coded consumables, that you don't want to wait to the restoration. It should be part of a maintenance plan or a check plan. And then after a restoration, those have to be updated. So here we see... Um, an example, if you're going to have an effective maintenance posture, you also have to ter determine if your, site, your staff on site is going to perform those tasks or whether you're going to go on call with a contract, contractor to do the same. And if you look at the left side, you want to make sure that your staff has the operational skills to perform the task, that they have access to the documentation, and it, at a minimum, elementary troubleshooting capability to isolate where the problem is. Remember, it was I, identify, locate, and uh, resolve. And in this case, we want to identify the problem quickly, and then we'll move to locating it. Um, access to expert consultation. Not everybody has the same skill level and expertise, so there's times uh, even within your own organizations that you need to have a hierarchy of calls and expertise because somebody may be on vacation or out that day and you need access um, to that, either that, to that person or to the next best person or to an outside source. And uh, we'll talk about emergency restoration kits, but these are developed uh, specifically for the types of installations that you have in your system and network. On the other side, if you're going to go on call to have a contractor um, available, you want to have a 24-hour hotline available. Um, 
you were going to have to need two or three numbers. So if that person happens to be at a movie and the phone's been muted, um, then, then who's the next uh, person to call in that case? You want to have pre-existing um, maintenance contracts with terms and conditions defined. So if it's uh, you know the day of the World Cup or so or Super Bowl Sunday and that and uh, you know it's a day that to some it's to say our system's down we got to repair it on others it's, it could be a holiday and that and terms and conditions may be different. Um, you always want to make sure you have experienced crews um, on a restoration and. And while there's always uh, time to have it, some extra hands available, you're going to really depend on your journeyman. And this is a case where we really, in our fiber training of emergency restoration courses, we really push to build the hands-on experience for the technicians and splicers. At the same time, making sure they have the knowledge behind the OTDR and the knowledge behind the types of outages and what else can go wrong and where, where should you look um, for potential uh, problems that aren't always obvious. Um, on call again, um, you know, making sure they have access to the equipment, the materials. For example, if, if you have a, um, a 288 fiber cable and it's been cut, the odds are that the contractor's not going to have a 288 fiber cable to do a non-retrievable slack uh, repair. So in other words, is that cable going to be in the cable yard and does somebody have access to it and to say, I need 700 feet of this cable and I need it delivered to this site. So think about where the cable is going to be housed, who's responsible for it, and uh, making sure it's the, the, the right cable and the right fiber for the, the restoration. And then there could be construction contracting. And, that, uh, and you'll see the, the picture here is actually a case where we buried uh, a series of loose tube cables, armored, unarmored, stranded, uh, central tube, and then we brought in augers and backhoes and had them dig up the cables. And uh, we looked at the types of stresses that were put on the cables and the fibers and the types of outages. And as you saw with the auger, the warning tape that was uh, very, barely visible. And, that, and in most cases, uh, the, the fibers inside actually survived um, the initial cut, some of them, not all of them. Okay. So part of the planning activities, develop an emergency response team. In other words, the hierarchy on who's going to make the calls, when they're going to make the calls, who the, where the responsibilities are and what the tasks they're responsible for doing are. Um, this should also include uh, good maps, good drawings, locations of splice, splice closures, retrievable slack, um, loss budgets, and especially minimum and maximum levels of the loss budgets. But should you have a, um, uh, an attenuator on a span and during emergency restoration, we may want to take the attenuators out because we may not care if we're going to get a 0.1 dB splice on an emergency restoration. We may take a 0.5 or 1 dB splice. Um, hopefully we're not that close to the edge where, where an attenuator would be an issue, but uh, it could be a consideration, especially in cable TV restorations. And uh, make sure you have a call list, and that, that should be part of that uh, response team. Okay. Um, here's a uh, simple flow chart. Um, so it should be, you know, number one is to isolate and, re and eliminate the transmission equipment immediately in that. So until we know that it's not a power problem or transmitter receiver problem, then we don't investigate the outside plant. So we want to eliminate the, um, the transmission equipment. Then we want to focus on the outside plant. And the, the point here is to identify the location of the problem and the extent of the problem. And uh, if you only have one OTDR, it's more of a problem because you can only test from one end. And if the cable, especially if it's a full cut, um, that means you're going to have to move the OTDR to the other end and, um, and uh, get the second and then reconcile the two um, readings that you're going to get. So then that's part of the location of the problem. And what we're really talking about here is accurate location of the problem. But as soon as you know that it's a physical break, uh, it's also a good time to have a truck roll and someone in, um, starting to drive the route and look for obvious um, failures, trees, uh, branches, car crashes, uh, augers and backhoes on the side of the road. And as soon as the OTDR gives us an approximate location, then we can zoom in and get that um, the, the, the search crew, shall we say, um, into the local area and um, 
we can't start to resolve the problem until we address many things around the problem itself, safety being one of those and that. So in the initial response, here's an example of a chart that shows uh, different um, levels where the dispatcher is now talking to the service restoration coordinator. And then there's a series of, uh, depending on the size and the scope of the organization, who these people are responsible to communicate with and communicate with each other. And so, um, you know, the call list notification, the review of alternate uh, service options for it. And then, um, you know, verification of the site location. Now, the OTDR is going to give us an approximate location, and that we, you know, we can talk about the accuracy of the OTDR. Um, but uh, we will talk more about that in a little while. But the first thing is, is getting somebody on site to do a review. And, and, and part of this is going to be the safety element. If the restoration is going to occur in a, a location that's unsafe, until the safety problem's been resolved, we can't move staff um, into a, an unsafe environment. And it could be also by identifying the cause of the failure, the types of equipment that needs to be brought in. And at the same time, if it's, say, it's an aerial structure and a pole came down, until we get the power problem resolved with the local utility, um, it's not going to be safe for, for anybody to be close to the, the damage point and until it's cleared by the utility to move in further. And that meantime, while that's occurring, the, um, the coordinator for the, the field restoration is addressing the safety issues, addressing what type of equipment's going to be necessary. Um, items, uh, for example, if it's underground, if we need vaults or handholds or optopeds or, you know, lots of different types of products that can be used on restorations. That, e that equipment has to start being um, transitioned to that location. And that meantime, the OTDR operator's got a lot of work to do f from point A and also from point B. And that, I want to address that in a little while, but right now let's move on to the, the next slide here. So when we start uh, the execution of the uh, emergency repairs, we have to follow the, emerge the restoration plan. Number one is, is this going to be a temporary restoration or a permanent? And depending on the type of entity that this belongs to in the service level agreements and whether you have an alternate route that you have switched to, um, this can, uh, the determination can vary. Um, if, there, if the route's protected, a ring or mesh topology, for example, then we can move to an immediate permanent restoration. However, if it's a temporary, if it's um, a dedicated route where we need to go to a um, temporary restoration, in other words, let's get this done very quickly, and then we'll come back and do a permanent later, but let's get the fibers repaired first. In other words, we will make compromises on attenuation at the expense of uh, doing a permanent restoration. And also, if you think about washouts and poles out, that sometimes a temporary restoration can literally be placing a cable between two locations on the ground, even though it should be an aerial route. And during that uh, transition from temporary to permanent, um, that cable is going to have to be protected. One, one restoration I was on, which was for a sprint system, was a railroad. Um, a bridge that, that caught fire and burned and took out the optical cable underneath it. Well, the fire damage was going to limit the permanent restoration, so it took three days for the permanent restoration to actually occur. And it wasn't the speed of the fiber group, it was the speed of the construction. So we did a temporary restoration and then transitioned over to a permanent. And during that transition period, we were able to place new vaults in get the cable, the correct cable, in, and trim to the right length and move with the, uh, the right splice closures and that to match up everything into it, address the slack issues, readdress as built drawings. So it, the, the permanent repair actually transitioned over quite easily from the uh, temporary. And that. So in, in the fiber cable splicing, we're talking four workers and two pairs. So this is a non-retrievable slack scenario to where you have two, um, two splice points where you've had a cut in the cable. The OTDR as, uh, operator has identified that not only did you have a cut at, at one location, but there's damage bo on both sides of, the de of that point. And this is a case where uh, expertise and OTDR training is critical to be able to determine how far back you cut the cable on both sides. 
and that at the same time, it's not just cutting out the damage. You're going to also cut back the cable to where's the best splice point to, to have placed. So this could be in a vault, could be on an aerial structure, but it may not be exactly where the fiber damage is. You may cut out several hundred feet further just because it's the best location. One uh, restoration I was on, there was a convenient splice closure several hundred feet away, and we said, let's just take it all the way back to this closure versus having a second, another closure that close together. Um, no optical reasons for it, but it was just a logical one less point of failure into the future, and that, that we were hoping to prevent. And then, um, you know, there's a time issue here, and uh, temporary and permanent are going to take different time elements. Uh, the weather is going to have a tremendous uh, amount of impact here and access to it. So it is time. Um, the quantity of splices uh, that it takes uh, to prep the closure, prep the site, prep the cable uh, takes time. But then once you get into production where that splicer is operating, um, then the, the number of splices is going to go pretty effectively and uh, efficiently. And again, remember the issue of prioritized uh, buffer tubes and fibers. And then there's a case after the restoration and during the restoration where the OTDR and optical loss test can occur. Now, the OTDR test can occur during the operation of the splicing and give guidance to the uh, restoration crew. So if they see something that's abnormal, in other words, the, the splicers have said they've spliced and the OTDR is saying, no, you haven't yet. You haven't cleaved the fiber. You haven't spliced the fiber. They should be following in a real-time mode and giving advice to the splicers. And, that, and this way, if the fiber's broken a meter away, they can say, we're not getting splices here, which means there's another break prior, either post or prior, and they need to cut back further. The sooner we identify those points, the better. So for the execution of the permanent repairs, we've already made a temporary restoration. So now you plan for the permanent repairs. And again, safety is going to be an issue. You're going to have access to, you know, where are you going to put your vaults, where are you going to put your handholds, where are you going to put your splice closures, your snowshoes, making sure all the materials are there, and then you're scheduling it. And normally this will occur on the graveyard shift, not during the daytime hours, and that's so that you have the least impact when you're doing a rollover from a temporary to a permanent repair. And then after the repair, everything needs to be redocumented and retested. And uh, this, so this is new OTDR traces, new optical loss testing, um, updating uh, as built uh, with new sequential markings and storage locations, um, uh, review, replenish the emergency restoration kits, and, re and the restoration and inventory needs to be um, updated. Uh, review the restoration event as a staff uh, meeting. What happened? Was it preventable? Was it not preventable? What worked? What didn't work? What can we improve on next time? Because we'd like to think that there's not going to be another restoration, but accidents happen and occurrences happen. You know. So part of this can be in the report, the uh, restoration report itself, the type and cause of the outage, uh, geographical area affected, the effects on customers, how many customers, um, were there equipment problems, and this could be anything from nuts and bolts to closures to splicing, OTDRs, jumpers. Um, and this is why you really need to practice restorations. You need to go through and dot the I's and cross the T's, make sure everything's covered because the second you're on an emergency restoration, then everything has to work seamlessly and unfortunately it doesn't seem to always occur that way. Something always goes wrong in that. So, but the more practice you have, the better and the more effective you are as a team. Um, you know, so you look and see whether you need to replace any equipment, uh, make alterations to your plans, um, you know, your documentation needs to be updated, and there's a series of uh, bullets on the right side that uh, talk about uh, items that should be within the documentation. Okay. And then uh, here's an example of a just a outdoor quick uh, restoration. You've got a mobile van here. You've got a generator, a couple cable tables um, for the text to work in. Um, you know, it's nice when you get a nice sunny day and you can have a restoration and that normally, 
you know, be, the weather's not going to be that great, and you're going to be dealing with a splicing truck or trailer, which is designed to protect uh, the workers and give us a nice, clean uh, environment and safe environment and comfortable environment. Um, I've mentioned a few restorations, probably the worst one. Uh, that I had uh, as far as comfort was uh, one that was about 25 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and it was so cold that uh, several of the fusion slicers locked up and that so fortunately we, fortunately we actually had mechanical slices were able to hit priority circuits but until we were able to warm up the splicing vehicle um, we had a real issue with the temperature and the environment and that, but it was tough for the, uh, the workers too. And that, so a good uh, vehicle is uh, extremely helpful and a uh, good investment. So as far as the equipment listed here, the, the least expensive equipment's at the top and the most expensive is at the bottom. And it's saying, and, and part of this is due to, especially those that are involved with premises networks, that sometimes it's just minor issues dealing with contamination and surface damage of connectors and the minor events that can cause an outage but that uh, it's good to have an inspection scope and a cleaning kit take care of those uh, problems. Uh, visual tracers for short, short distance uh, type runs for continuity checks real quick. But uh, for outside plant, your two basic pieces of equipment are going to be the optical power meter and the OTDR and then great documentation. And, uh, so the OTDR, um, we use it for cable acceptance testing, and that's where we get the original documents, the traces that uh, show us wh where the, the fiber uh, performance, the splice loss values are, what the distance is, uh, if there's any reflectivity issues, what the level of them are, and such. Um, but then we really need to tie these in with as-built drawings, and, that, and you'll see the, the reason in a little, in a little while here. Um, but uh, we want to know the location and, uh, of every splice. We want to know its attenuation. Uh, we're going to use it for fault locating. Uh, we're going to use span signatures at multiple wavelengths, and we want to know our uh, reflection and return loss uh, values as well. And then the power meter, making sure that um, you know, we can test both receive and transmit power levels quickly, and then and we also use it for end-to-end -end, um, loss evaluation. Now, the, the, there's some other equipment that's helpful. Uh, I mentioned the inspection scope for surface conditions. Um, those are relatively easy to, to work with, uh, low cost, and uh, can be virtually at any site. But this is, again, more prevention of an outage. Visible lasers allow us to do quick continuity checks. And that they do have limited range in that, but they are good. And one thing, as I mentioned, the one splice where maybe it was broken prior to the to the where the actual or there was damage prior to the breakpoint. You can always put a field uh, VFL in and inject up, and if it's localized, you can be able to see that. Um, and then fiber identifiers. Uh, go ahead and switch your light source over to two kilohertz modulation, and you can go to where the fiber was cut. With the uh, where the OTDR shows it's cut, and you can also clamp on a fiber and move up and down the fiber to find out if it's approximate uh, location, because the VFL, the visual laser, won't help you at at long distances. Uh, another trick I found is use the OTDR, put it in the real time, and then uh, once somebody scribes the fiber, making sure you're on the right fiber, you should see the Fresnel reflection caused by that scribe jump up on the OTDR trace immediately, and you can confirm, okay, got it, you're there, you know, we're seeing it here, and you have continuity to that point, and then set your cursor at that point as well, okay? Um, but Going back to the geography and the mapping systems is um, the OTDR works on um, index of refraction and it doesn't match up with the, the cable sequential markings. So most of our um, proximity locations are actually not that correct and it depends on the amount of the helical wrap and that that's inside the, the, the cable itself. So what we really want to do is have good documentation. So if you have a splice closure, what's the sequential marking coming in? If you have a, um, uh, a storage vault, how much cable is stored there? What's the sequential markings, et cetera? Um, and these could be in either footage or in metric. Uh, but they do assist us tremendously in installations and maintenance. 
and again, do good documentation here. And here's a case uh, at the bottom of simple calculation. At Vault A, the sequential marking was at 427 meters, and at Vault B, it was at 2,859 meters. So the length in between was 2,432 meters, subtracting the difference. Now, if I took the OTDR's index of refraction reading, well, first, uh, just as a little educational lesson here, the speed of light in a vacuum is 186,291 miles per second in a vacuum. But most fibers are, are uh, about 40% um, less than that, so 126,000 approximately with, if the fiber has an index 1.471. So it's a ratio of the difference of the speed of light in the vacuum versus the speed of light in that specific fiber. Each fiber manufacturer has a different index of refraction, not only for their fiber, but at different wavelengths for their fiber. Um, at the same time, you're seeing where the cable, the fibers are loose in the buffer tube, so the, the fiber length's longer than the buffer tube. The buffer tube spirals down the cable, which means it's longer than the cable sheath. And then if you have a high fiber count cable, the inner rows and the outer rows are two different lengths as well. So all these affect the actual accuracy of the OTDR to actually identify exactly where the fault is. So what we really want to know is that last bullet was measured from the last physically known location. And what that means is if we know we have a splice point at this one point, don't measure from the hub site out to the failure. Measure from that last splice point. Use a two-point uh, method. Put one cursor at that splice. Put the second cursor at where the failure is. And that's where these points come uh, are very critical at what you're seeing on screen now. And the left screen, you're seeing a non-reflective roll-off that could be caused by a, a, a bad break, extreme macro bend, uh, water, which is underground, um, and many cables are underground, so water intrusion can get to them really quickly, or cable gel and loose tube gel filled cables. In that case, there's a good likelihood we're just going to have a roll off without a reflection. And now, if I'm running the OTDR, I'm in real time, that, that tells me uh, the approximate location quickly, and I can give that information to the field on the people doing the truck roll to get them to say, we need to know more about the site. But what I want to do as an OTDR operator is now go to another fiber and until I get one that shows a reflection. And if you notice the right one, we're getting a slight reflection. And at that point, that allows me to put the cursor of the OTDR accurately at that breakpoint. And that's going to be my reference point at that point. And now I have a distance. Now I want to stay in real time and I want to check every fiber to say, are they all at that location or are they further out? And so at this point, if you see this uh, diagram, we're showing that not only where the break is at, on the bottom, but we're saying that there's a stress earlier on, on the, the pre-side from side A and then another stress from side B. Now that means I have to take the OTDR. When I'm finished with side A and I notice that all the damages occur only at one point, you know, this is the worst case, I've identified it. That OTDR now it needs to go to the other end and do the same thing. If you have two OTDRs, that much better. You know, this way you could have uh, two different tasks occurring um, and, that, and save some time. And then up at the upper parts, uh, the upper diagram showing, again, different splices uh, where they would show up on an OTDR. But you're always referencing from a known splice point. Okay? So another uh, thing to help you out here is use the 1550 nanometer wavelength versus the 1310. Um, the reason is this wavelength is more sensitive to stresses, and it will locate stresses before, uh, before the break or after if you're testing from the offset in um, to identify exactly where the stress points are. And that. So we want to be in real time. We want to identify these. Once we do, then we can average to get a, a better measurement. But uh, we want to get those distances identified because it's the difference between the two stress points, not just the break point that tells us on a non-retrievable or retrievable side point how much cable we're going to need to pull in and that to make the restoration itself. So really use your um, um, vertical and horizontal resolution scales on the OTDR to make sure to identify the, the extent of the damage. And that. So here's an example of a uh, mid-span restoration where the cable cut was uh, in the middle as a non-retrievable slack scenario. And so we're going to perform a mid-entry at two locations here. And part of the reason here is not always 
all the fibers are broken or cut in a or damaged in a restoration or an outage. Now there still may be some that are good. And in this case, what we're do taking is we're assuming that there's a partial damage, not a full damage. We're going to do a mid-entry back from that point. We're going to have to, of course, find a physical location where best to do this. Perform a mid-entry, go into the, the correct buffer tubes, do it, and now splice in another cable around the failure to a second mid-entry site. And at this point, we're going to then roll the, the damaged fibers over to the new fibers, put them and get them carrying traffic, and you can retest this um, before or after, um, what it, depending if temporary and how much of an emergency it is. And then we can perform either a permanent repair in the middle and then take out the restoration kit later. But we're going to end up rolling circuits back and forth, retesting and redocumenting. So give thought to this on how you would occur with this with a cable that is not 100% uh, broken, but only with a partial um, percentage of the fibers out. And uh, here's a, um, an emergency restoration jump kit. Sometimes they're just called emergency restoration kits. But what this is is a span of cable uh, that matches the cable in the, um, in the outside plant. So if you're putting in a 72 fiber cable and you have 144 and that, you want your restoration jump kits to be at 144, always the worst case. And that you can always have extra fibers, but uh, for a temporary fix, you want them you know, have, um, make sure you have enough fibers to be able to handle the transition. Um, so the kit should have the cable length that's uh, required for what you would expect on a restoration. And kind of, of course, some of this can come from the history of outages, and other of it could be because your pole distances could be X length, and that you're going to need to go maybe two poles or three poles uh, to take out a section. In this case, uh, the cables terminated in splice closures. The cables prepped. The buffer tubes are routed to um, uh, the proper splice tray, and um, and uh, half the work's virtually done in this case. So now you would have the uh, the the broken ends of the cables, and that and while you bring in the the restoration kit out, somebody could be on site prepping the other cable, the cable ends, the damaged cable ends, getting those prepared so when this comes out, you enter them into the splice closure and then start your splice work. And that, so, and the kit should include uh, the, the, the cable, the closures, the splices, the tools, um, work, work surfaces, lighting, uh, whatever is going to be needed. And that, so um, some operational steps for a partial system outage. Number one, safety is always going to come first. And that, and that can also address access to the site. Uh, where are you actually going to perform the work? Um, how do you deploy your, your equipment, your staff, your vehicles uh, properly? The identification of the damage, how far does it extend um, from the splice point itself? And, that, and again, that's the OTDR operator skills that are going to be critical. And then, um, you know, getting the cable and the closure prepared soon so that you can bring the splicers in. And then the splicing. Uh, on the splicing, you still have the choice of fusion or mechanical. If it's a non-retrievable slack scenario and you only have one fusion splicer, you may set up where you're fusion splicing at one end, the other end's being prepared and possibly even spliced with mechanical splices. And after the fusion splicing is completed, move the splicer to the second location and then start transitioning from the mechanical to the fusion. The advantage of the mechanicals, you don't need power. It's simple tooling. They're pretty quick to do, and they typically 0.1 dB splices are better. Um, and the reflection standards are pretty good, you know, equal to, um, you know, normally an SPC or uh, UPC um, physical um, polish connector. Um, and then you have to retest, redocument, turn up your primary fibers, you know, and then um, start planning for your permanent restoration. Okay. Um, for a full system outage, again, safety always uh, first. Uh, actually, it's the second bullet, but it should be the first one. And then protect the non-working fibers. So, you know, we have, uh, or the, I should say, the protect the working fibers in this case. So if it's, uh, you know, case, oh, excuse me. If it's a full system outage, cable's cut. You know, you're going to protect the, ca the cables beyond the point where the breakage occurs and that do it. 
You have to get access for your repair crews and vehicles in there, set up a work area, deploy your uh, restoration teams there, making sure that you're addressing hardware. And again, uh, aerial requirements are unique depending on the pole or tower structure. Um, you know, get the uh, cable enclosure prepared as soon as possible so that the splicers can move in. Uh, the test, the OTDR operator should be literally online in real time. Um, also remember, good voice communications is going to be critical between the, between the splicers and the OTDR operators. So uh, whether you use fiber talk sets or um, other means of cellular traffic or, or other, uh, you do want to have that communication. I like to use fiber talk sets because it allows me to talk one-on-one -on -one between the, the OTDR operator and the splicer. And, that, and there's all sorts of variations of, uh, of talk sets that, um, that work and are comfortable for techs in the field. And then, um, you know, uh, be prepared to roll circuits so that you're testing them, documenting them, and then rolling them for the transmission equipment soon to get back online. And then make your plan for, uh, for your permanent restoration. Okay. So as a summary, planning's critical because once you go from a, into a reactive stage, that means that you're really not in sync. You're reacting to a situation. And if you have good planning, people know what's expected of them. The equipment um, should be in good shape. People know where it is, the, the types of tools, uh, the restoration, whether it's underground or aerial. Uh, easily identified so that um, the right uh, restoration plan can be um, performed. Um, making sure we have good documentation for everyone to use so we know what our loss budgets are, if we can go for a higher loss, where the, where the cable slack is, how much cable slack. Make a real difference on retrievable slack. If you have enough slack and bolts that you can pull back and only have one repair point versus a non-retrievable slack where you're going to have two. And, that, and if you do have to go to that scenario between two different vaults that you, um, instead of putting a new vault in, may end up just taking the cable all the way back to the, to, to the two vaults and that and putting in a whole new section there anyway. You know? And uh, making sure that we've addressed all the, the equipment issues, the staff issues, the training, and the skills of everyone involved, and that the safety program is paramount to implement and to follow. Um, and if it's not, then we don't do anything until it is. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, I'm going to take some questions in, in a few minutes, but I just want to um, talk about it in our next webinar because. In a one-hour time frame, you don't have a lot of time to go into detail on the types of restorations and postures and restorations. So I wanted to go more specific on aerial and underground and the methods of, again, going back into retrieval, non-retrievable slack scenarios, and especially using the OTDR correctly. And that, and that means uh, troubleshooting, and also a case of troubleshooting for advanced networks, ring and mesh architectures, DWDM systems uh, as well. And that. So, um, I'll give you the questions because one of the questions we always get is how do people find out more information? And so we can put this slide. Okay. Um, I, Jim sitting next to me is just uh, reviewing the. We get a lot of questions and, and that brought to it, so he's going to try to refer over to me. So hopefully we can handle this very well. So, um, so one of the questions, uh, what are the um, important uh, considerations for locating exact point of failure and long links uh, with a OTDR? Um, number one, you want to be operating at, uh, at single mode, uh, I assume here, at 1550 nanometers. Uh, you have lower attenuation. You want to increase the pulse width of the OTDR so that you have the greatest dynamic range and so that you're far above the, the noise floor of the, um, the instrument. Um, the other is always use the two-point um, uh, method of, of uh, distance so that you place your cursor at the last known splice point. And even if this means if you, the, you know, a 0.05 dB splice you should be able to identify, use your vertical scale to increase the resolution so they're easier to find. Um, you know, normally I'm not a, in favor of somebody going up and opening up a splice closer to create a macro bin, you know, but if you had 144 splices and they're all perfect, you know, we'd have to know where that point actually is on the OTDR. But 
if you did your original documentation correctly and you put markers on your splice points before you're splicing, the, these notations should be noted where it is even if you can't see a splice. But that's where you'd put your A marker or A cursor. And then your B cursor would be at the point of failure number one. And that, so you can say, okay, from this point at vault A to vault uh, to the, the the outage point, um, here's the distance. Now, once you get the distance, remember your as-built drawing should have your sequential markings, and so now you can look on the sequential cable. It should get you close by. Now you want to still stay with your your two cursors, but you want to keep the cursor uh, B on the failure point. Move cursor A back toward where the OTDR is until you find the stress point and how far back it's stressed. And you want to now, once you get those two points identified, you want to check all the fibers with those two cursors. And if for any reason one of the um, stress points is prior to the A marker now, then you want to move the A marker back. And then still the distance between A and B is going to tell you how much of that cable has to be replaced and that for it. Okay. Um, the, um, another question here is, uh, what guidelines should be applied to minimum cable length used for repair and a fiber optic cable restoration? Um, most of the time, the, the case is if, are you really talking physically, you know, on where the cable, where are you going to put a splice closure? Because if you don't have retrievable slack, you're not going to be able to pull in. Um, that cable, and you don't want to be a meter short and putting two closures a meter apart from each other. Um, you know, normally you'd want to go back to another splice point and, and use it, and, and that so a prior one. But it depends if it's aerial underground. You're going to have to determine that. Another point too is that the OTDR's pulse width is going to determine uh, how the resolution in between two splices. You put them too close together, you will not be able to determine what the loss is from the first splice versus the second splice here as well. Okay. Um, a question, a good one here. Do you recommend using only factory manufactured emergency restoration kits or should field made, uh, made ERKs be used? I like the field made ones. Um, and that, there's some great um, ones that companies make and there's nothing wrong with them, but I think you need to be a part of it. So if you're going to have one made, it should be tailored around your splice closure, number one, because that's the closure your staff is trained on and what they use. And, that, and one of the things when you select a splice closure for just your conventional splicing, you should be taking a look at it, is how well would this work in a restoration, not just an inline splice or a branch splice scenario. And that, um, so it's, it's important to tailor it that way. Secondly is if I can use the same cable that, I can, uh, that I'm using in the outside plant, then I'm going to match the cable structure, the, ki the fiber manufacturer, the fiber type, um, the fiber manufacturing process, fiber tolerances, all those um, details come into play. So I really suggest that you, you do build it yourself. You get your own staff trained in building it as well. If you do go outside and buy a factory manufactured, you should supply to them the cable and the clo uh, at least advise them the closures you want them prepared into. And uh, one point here, too, on a restoration is uh, uh, something I didn't bring up, but if you don't have good yard management of your cable, your spare cable, um, I know of one outage that occurred where the restoration occurred, uh, the OTDR reports, optical loss test reports were good, but the system wouldn't work. And the reason the system wouldn't work is that it was a DWDM system that handshaked out of band. In other words, it used the L band at 1625 nanometers for handshaking. And um, this fiber, the replacement fiber, would not pass 1625 nanometers. Therefore, the, the system couldn't handshake. Therefore, it couldn't transmit, even though optically it was good at 1310 and 1550. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I've got a couple of other questions that came up that I'll handle here. One of them that we hear all the time is, where can I find out more about the content of what was just presented? And particularly on emergency restorations, we have a series of DVDs two specifically, one on OTD theory of operation and the other on troubleshooting of fiber optic link, which are available for more information. We also offer training venues all around the United States on emergency restoration and can develop a custom presentation for you if you would like. Another question that we got just now was, are, do we have downloads of these PowerPoints available? Uh, no, we do not because there's a lot of proprietary information we put into these slides 
that we use for our training uh, classes. But you can go back to uh, Lightwave online. This particular webinar will be reposted in 24 hours, and you can watch it continually on demand. You can also go back and watch the uh, first two seminars that we put online uh, available also. If you, there's, we can get a full description of all the courses we offer at lightbrigade.com. And we have technical support available to any of you. Uh, that number is listed, the email address, and the, the phone numbers are available for, uh, for you to see that. Let's see, one more question came up. Hang on a second. Wait. No, we're good on that one. Okay. Uh, folks, I'd like to thank you very much for your attendance. This brings this webinar to a close. Our next webinar will be the last Wednesday in May. I believe that's May 29th. Well, Larry will do the continuation of the emergency restoration uh, presentations that he talked about earlier. Thank you very much for your time, folks.